Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 302 of Real Blend, a podcast that happily exists in a world where Christopher Nolan has an Oscar for Best Director. My name is Sean O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend, a co-host of the Real Blend podcast. And on this week's show, we are going to react to the Oscars broadcast and we're wrapping up something that we have self-promoted as Dune Blend with the return of Hans Zimmer to discuss Dune Part 2. And just saying that out loud gave me goosebumps. That's insane. Uh, Hans Zimmer's joining the show. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to ha- welcome to Real Blend. I know it's Friday and I know you're, you're you might be over the Oscars, but we have a lot of thoughts and we kind of figured you guys would want to hear from us regarding them. Uh, I'm going to start with Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hello, Jacob. How are you, sir? I'm picturing um, Kevin McCarthy, who is not with us this week because he had a right. a, a prior work commitment. But I, I picture him existing in a uh, post Nolan Oscar world, just laying on the ground, hugging his two still book copies of Oppenheimer. <laughs> um, that's where I picture he's at right now. To tell the truth, Jake. Kevin imploded. He Kevin just, no longer is with us. He, uh, yeah, just <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> Popped like a soap bubble the minute it happened. Uh, yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly <laughs> and right. the winner is Christopher Nolan. Kevin glo- glowed and popped. And just yeah. done. But to your point, um, I you know I do I like to think that our uh, thoughts on the Oscars are worth listening to, if only because our guest today, Mr. Zimmer, uh, referred to us as people who are helping save cinema. Ooh, it's true. We did. Yes, it's true. That's a that's a great tease. Uh, filling in for Kevin is Gabe Kovach in the producer chair and yes. co-host chair. Hey, yes. Gabe, how are you? Say, I'm I'm savior of cinema number four on the call sheet. <laughs> I think. <So> for, <laughs> uh, Sean, yeah. you know you know how I know that we're in. The the best universe within the multiverse tell me because not only does christopher nolan have an oscar but that yeah. trophy was handed to him by steven spielberg oh, by spielberg God. on the 30th anniversary <laughs> of the year that spielberg won his first oscar for Amazing. directing a yeah. biopic about an important person during world war ii and yeah. not to jump ahead because we are going to comment about the um uh, the oscars in general but the format of the multiple uh winners and maybe they've never done this for directors, but instead of needing five directors to come out and, and honor the, the category, they just had the, the one came out. He was like, all I'm need. sufficient. Could you imagine yeah. if they had 10 Best Picture winners come out to do the, to the 10 Best Picture? <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered because Pacino would have skipped over all of them. <laughs> and yet they were still kind of vamping for time at the end yeah, to, yeah. To, to get people to Abbott Elementary. Uh, that was Michelle's one question because Michelle went to bed early last night and when she and woke up this morning and she said, did you watch Abbott Elementary? <laughs> no, no, honey. I went right to bed after the Oscars. Did she's you see a teacher, who was on it? So she's a huge fan. No, who was on it? It was Bradley Cooper. Uh, was he really? Uh, yep. Ah, good for yeah, him. I That's love awesome. That they promoted him as, uh, even though he could have been Oscar winner, so, they promoted him as Oscar nominee because they knew he wasn't going to win. So Aww. he was, uh, he was in more of Abbott Elementary than he was in the Oscars broadcast. Oh, <laughs> oh. I love for 12. Now. He's 0 for 12. Hey man. Listen, I say that just sounds like he's doing great work, you know? Look, at the, you know, at the end of the day, he gets to be Bradley Cooper. He's Pretty good. fine. Yeah. Pretty solid. As Kimmel joked, he's a winner of the genetic lottery. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. exactly right. Exactly. They for based, most of the people in the auditorium. They actually based Limitless on his life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, if you're watching us on the YouTube channel, thank you very much for joining us. We are gaining subscribers at a um, at a frantic pace, and, and we love it. It means you guys are sharing the show with friends and family members and people who love movies as much as we all love movies and like getting together on a weekly basis to geek out about them, as we are going to today with our friend Hans Zimmer. If you're listening to us in an audio format but want to check out the video feed, we are at youtube.com backslash Real Blend Podcast. If you're joining us for the first time, hit subscribe, turn on your notifications, and you'll be alerted every time that the show drops, or just listen to us where you get your audio podcast needs met. Have you signed up yet for Real Blend Premium? Guys, I tell you about it every single week. The Real Blend Premium gets you an ad-free version of the show, and it also gets you a newsletter from me. A little additional insight into the film industry from a seasoned veteran like myself i just figured every newsletter now is just a, just like a selfie of you just look just a the missive camera. we should get you you don't have like a like an author photo in the back of your books do you i feel like no oh i do yeah, yeah you do I okay do. sure i yeah. need to look at which one you have I, that's the pose i want you to have when i when i open the 
Back that would be great <laughs> if yeah. someone can, because we've got some Photoshop wizards out there working True. on this. Can I My get God, a, a pretentious, I get a pretentious real blend author shot? I'm actually giving it to and, you guys and right in now. In the spirit of um of the real blend Oppenheimer photo that was created yes. of us, oh um, yeah, how you feeling can about we, that? Can game? we make uh, can we make Sean the balding one this time? <laughs> I was gonna say the hairline's looking good. <laughs> that, today, Jake. that was uh, everyone's that really bothered you to that. <laughs> it, it, it bothered everybody because that's Wait, he's the only no, one on the show. Who's, who's won an award for his hair, right? <laughs> <laughs> Gabe, I, I will say won, uh, an award for my hair. I've won two. Oh, I'm awards sorry for my hair. Well, the minute I opened that photo, I thought, "Ooh, Jake's gonna have a problem with that." <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to chalk it up to like, "Well, it's a role that won Downey the Oscar," but it didn't yeah. help me at all. <laughs> all right. Speaking of Oscar winners um, and people who we adore. Uh, I don't know if we've said that, but we do adore Hans Zimmer. And Hans Zimmer came on the show once before and was fantastic. Please go back and check out that old episode. I believe it was for... Uh, the first for Dune Part 1? Yeah, it was for Dune Part yeah. 1. Yes, That's it was. when we became um, show friends. Show friends. That's show what friends. I like to call us. Yes, he is. And then this time he's upgraded us from show friends. <laughs> to saviors of Just, cinema. <laughs> <laughs> This will all make sense in context. Um, and so I'm going to stop trying to explain it and just throw <laughs> it to this week's official interview on behalf of Dune Part 2. It's Hans Zimmer, legendary composer and show friend of the Roblox podcast. Oh, look, at, look, at the, the dogs are having a go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, They're saying okay. hello to you as well. They're also fans right. of yours. Right. Yes. Good. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. They're unofficial co-hosts of yeah. ours. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Ask me anything. Oh, we'd love to hear that. Well, we are going to start you out by just saying welcome back to the Real Blend podcast. We absolutely Thank loved you. having you on not too long back. And so we're excited that you are back. I am going to lead us off with this. Um, you know, I, one of my favorite facts that I feel like a lot of people forget is that John Williams uh, did not write the Imperial March for Star Wars A New Hope. He wrote it for The Empire Strikes Back. It took a sequel for him to be inspired to write that incredible, iconic piece of music. So I'm sort of curious for you, what did you get in terms of musical inspiration out of this sequel that maybe wasn't necessarily there for part one? Well, um, so, okay, the advantage I had over John Williams, uh, but actually I don't have any advantage over John Williams because <laughs> John Williams is the superior composer. So let's start there, right? Okay. But the advantage I had functionally over John Williams is I knew the book so well. Mm. So when we finished Dune part one, um, I just carried on writing. And mm. at one point, like, Denise says it was six months or so uh, after the movie opened. Uh, he phoned me up and he said, St stop writing, stop sending me things. The movie has <laughs> opened. And, I'm, and I said, no, 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 no. I know the movie has opened. And we were not greenlit for the second part at that point, you know. So we never knew if we were going to do it. It's just, but I'm pretty persistent. I'm pretty dogged. So I just kept writing. So I wrote what is now the main theme, really the love theme of, I hate you calling it the love theme, but you know, um, well, it's a love theme for, for this movie, which is really the main theme. And then we went on tour all over Europe and, you know, playing, playing um, arenas, 20,000 people a night. And I would start it off every night by playing a tune that they didn't recognize and <laughs> they didn't know. And I would never tell them what it was. Um, and I just I just had this idea that if we got to do the sequel, or not, it's not a sequel. And, yeah, it is a sequel, I suppose. It's, it's the continuation of the story, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be interesting that there's a, there would be a whole bunch of people like hundreds of thousands, I suppose, that that might come and see the movie and go, gosh, <laughs> somehow emotionally, the, uh, something resonates here that I that I know, mm. right? So, so yes, I was I, I I had an advantage to Mr. Williams in so far that I knew where the story was going to go. Mm. The other advantage I had over Mr. Williams was that I was obsessed. You know, I just carried <laughs> on writing and. Um, you know, the filmmakers I work with and the filmmakers I love working with, you know, like uh, Chris Nolan or, or Denis Villeneuve, um, they let me write away from picture. 
In fact, um, it's, it's only just now after, you know, after Denis and I did a lot of press together that I suddenly realized he never let me read the script because mm. I knew the story so well. So he, he wanted, you know, I was the first person on, you know, he, mm. I, he was the first person he talked to about the, um, the first movie. Um, and, and I knew so much from the book and I remembered the book so well. So he wanted somebody who kept like this pure teenage spirit because we were both teenagers when we read the book and we were both teenagers when we fell in love with it. And so, but here's the thing. We were, we managed to sort of, I think we, we managed to recapture that teenage spirit, but we managed to execute the work with the experience of having done a load of movies in the meantime and, you know, having grown up and figured out how to not go and make a complete mess of it. Wow. Uh, Hans, I'm very curious when you return to a franchise, whether it be The Dark Knight or, or even coming back to Dune and, and you're returning to a cinematic world and you said you you kept writing. So what is your relationship to the existing music in the sense that, like, do you feel obligated at certain points to reference it? or, or Yes. You... Yes. Um, there, there, there was a moment, I can't even remember when, but I remember there was like a moment where I was where I suddenly went, oh, I better listen to the old one again, the first one again, because I am. I think I'm leaving it too far behind. Really interesting. Um, because what happens with me is, you know, um, once I've written it, it's like I've written it out of my system, you know, mm. and that's it's uh, it's it's on to new things. So, you know, I mean, if we go back to Dark Knight, I had done all these horrible experiments for the Joker. Mm -hmm. And um, there, came, there came a day where we had to go and dub, a, you know, more than a trailer, we had to dub a prologue, which Chris wanted to put out into the theaters. Mm -hmm. And I remember Chris actually getting a little bit of cold feet, putting this crazy material in. Mm -hmm. And he liked it. But, you know, it... it I mean, the Joker thing was probably most the most uncommercial, um, brutal, I don't know, a dissonant, nasty, fingers down the blackboard type of thing. And, <laughs> you know, go, but I, I've done that a few times now. And I think I've mainly done this with Warner Brothers, um, where I write something for their big summer movie or their big Christmas movie or something, which is completely uncompromising and, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> You know, not cuddly and friendly, um, <laughs> but but I think I think that's part of part of the job. You know, part of the job is to go and 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 commit and be daring. And you know, and when you work with people like Chris, or if you work obviously you work with people like Denis, Denis well enough. And I don't know if you guys have seen, but lately there has been like this sort of love fest between Denis and Chris. Um, yes. Yeah. You know where they're interviewing each other, and the and in fact we we went to it. Um, we went. I was invited to a dinner the other night, um, where Chris was being honoured. You know, and, and I was sitting at the table with Dindy. So you know, it, 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 and it, and 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 it was, you know, and 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 the whole the whole gang was there. You know, Michael Caine was there. You know, and I mean, Killian Murphy. You know, people. And you should not forget that. It's it's been a handful of movies with Chris. It's been a handful of movies with Denis, but with Chris, it's been twenty years. It's been sure. or twenty one years that we've been working together in one way or the other, mm. you know. And Denis and, and I, I mean, we're we're so. I I remember getting a getting a, um, a FaceTime call from him, and I thought. It was something about the movie, and you know, I start talking about a scene, and he just got, he just says, "We're not talking about the movie. We're only talking about friendship today." Oh, you know, that's and, wonderful! And, you know, that's the people you want to work with. Yeah, I, um, I have to bring this up, Kevin. I'm really sorry. I have to tell this story. We just had Denis on the show, uh -huh. and we brought up the interviews that he'd been doing with Mr. Nolan, and we've had Mr. Nolan on the show a couple of times as well, right. too. And we said you're basically friends with Chris at this point, and Denis goes. No, no, no! I need to stop you right now. He's like, we are 
closely uh, like approaching a friendship, but he was hesitant to like embrace the fact that they're friends because he still keeps Nolan on this this level of this this pedestal. And I understand it. But like Kevin had to say to Denis, like, you know, the people think of you that way. Also, like you're also a genius filmmaker that we have so much respect for. Well, but you see, it could have got, for instance, it could have gone really wrong that I did, you know, that I switched from um, working on Chris Nolan movies to working with Denis. Um, and one of the first people to really embrace and congratulate me on 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 the uh, on the first score was Chris, you know. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's it's. Uh, here's the thing: they're both great filmmakers you right. know they're great proponents of film you know we made a movie in 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 this dune part too that you have to you have to see on the bigger screen otherwise you are denying yourself an experience you know you're denying yourself quite quite a bit of um, actual footage you know uh, the, you know the, 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 you you're denying yourself things you you can only see on the ground i see that you're wearing an imax hoodie i mean yes okay great okay so <laughs> yeah. I, you're on I, the I right can, show I, yeah i, can, I yeah. can stop talking right now yeah you know well, because 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 you get it you get it yeah. and 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 i i venture my guess is the reason you get it is because as as much fun it is to watch things on your iPad or on your whatever it is you're watching or on your, your your laptop or whatever, there is an experience that you have when when the lights go down and you're surrounded by strangers and you all get to share the same dream or a version of the same dream. And the and it's it's a big image and it just the image sucks you in. And the the speakers are Maybe a little bit bigger than your headphones, you mm -hmm. know, like or whatever, <laughs> you know. And um, I mean, that was, you know, it's it's like, uh, and I, I understand why Chris, but Chris and Denis both got very very angry about it, you know. When when um, on the previous movie, I mean, we, we we were told fifteen minutes before they announced it to the world that we were going to go and and day and date stream, sure and. No, nobody asked us. Nobody asked Denny. Nobody asked me. And in a funny way, um, I, 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 you need to ask me. If you tell me we're going to go and on streaming, if you if you tell me we're going to go, if we're going to make a movie that is basically going to go straight to television or straight to streaming or whatever, mm -hmm. great, I can handle that because I'll write it differently. I, you know, I won't put that much bottom end into things. You know, my drums will sound different. My top end will sound different. It'll be quite a different score. You sure. Know? And, um, not only that, the, 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 the frequency range is going to be different. Um, I know that if you are, you know, like like look, the way we're looking at each other right now, I mean, you know, we can take in the image of ourselves in one go, but mm. if you're if you're on a big screen, it takes a while for your eye to wander across the screen. So the the, the rhythms are different, you know. Things things have to th things have to slow down. They have to breathe, mm. or they're allowed to breathe. You know, so film, so film itself. Now, 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 I'm going. Now I'm going full Nolan, right? Here. Please, <laughs> you know, I'm going please, full Nolan. Um, <laughs> or full IMAX. You know, it's like um, we, we humans. I think it's one of the great things we can do. We can we're storytellers, and we can. You know, I remember on Black Hawk Down working with Baba Mal and him explaining that he comes from a from a line of storytellers that goes back 2000 years mm. you know and even though you can't understand what he's singing about you know whatever he's singing about is profound and important and is part of you know human culture mm. and it's part of what got us here yeah. you know and and the same with the same with cinema you know um Make it, making everything making everything small or making or isolating using cinema um 
or streaming to isolate us from each other, I'm not sure it's a good idea, you know? No. Yeah. I mean, Mr. Zimmer, you're talking to somebody who saw Dunkirk six times in 70 millimeter IMAX in different cities across the country and Canada as well. And I've, I've been uh, a part of that 143 70 millimeter IMAX experience for so long. It's changed the way I view movies. But, you know, you, you talk about uh, reading the book as a kid and and, and the, the themes of Dune, I, I find so fascinating. And there's a line in the first film, which is also from Frank Herbert's book, which is the mystery of life isn't a problem to solve but a reality to experience. And I find that to be a brilliant quote. I think it's a deep thematic part of the Dune story. I was just curious what that quote means to you, how you view your life in terms of be it not being a, a problem to solve, but a reality to experience, but also maybe how you apply that to the way you make music. Well, I'm going to give you a, not a quite a counter quote, but I remember, um, working on Thin Red Line, you know, with Terry Malick. Mm. One of your best scores, said, one of my favorite scores you, you ever did. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Terry was very inspiring. And part, part of what, you know, I just remember him saying one day, you know, the question is always more interesting than the answer, mm. which is a little bit like, you know, you want to experience life, you know. It, I, I, yeah, it, you know, it, it gets... Right. I mean, okay. I'm I'm going, I'm going to narrow it down to writing film scores, you know, for a moment, mm -hmm. and go. Yeah, it it gets tough. You know, I sit there for two weeks, knocking my head against the wall, and go. I have no idea what to do. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't trade it for anything else. I wouldn't trade the experience for anything else. I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade the opportunity of. Number one, okay, so this is this is going to be the, a lengthy answer. I wouldn't trade the opportunity, number one, of working with the filmmakers I work with. I mean, the editor on Dune, Joe Walker, and I have been, you know, on and off working together since 1988. That's, that's a, you know, that's a fair length yeah. of time mm -hmm. of, um, you know, honing our style or honing our commitment to how we're going to go and do this, right? Um the musicians that are the, the the difference between Dune and sort of pretty much any other score I can think of is number one, it's not an orchestral score out of an obvious reason that I wanted to, I, I did not want a, a science fiction movie to have a um, you know a European classical uh, music sound. You know, yeah. I mean, I I just I just think in. You know, uh, as much I, I love John Williams, I love Star Wars. Actually, I love The Empire Strikes Back most. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but I just think that, you know it, it, that that wasn't my job. My job wasn't to go and and imitate a John Williams score. My job was to go. Hang on a second. We are in the future. We are in on a totally different planet. Let's go and invent instruments, and then. The other part, why do I love what I do, is because the musicians on this score, they're all virtuosos. You know, they're, they're like Guthrie Gavin. You know, you, you ask any guitarist out there, he's, you know, considered one of one of the truly the best in the world. Tina Guo, you know, um, Pedro Eustace, you know, these, the, the, I can go on and on. Loa Kotler, I mean, that voice, you know, to have that courage in the first movie to just like, you know, slice the eyeballs off, you know, <laughs> with, with her voice. You know, it's, it's like, you, you know, it's like really going for it. So every single person, every single person who was part of this, uh, part of this journey and who is part of this journey, you know, is um, not only extraordinarily good at, at what they do, I mean, truly a virtuoso, but fearless in, in their own way, and at the same time, completely collegial. And I was, I, 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 I was watching Maestro. You, you know, I get in that movie. You get to the scene, which is the Bernstein conducting Mahler second at Eli Cathedral, and mm. it, it's actually one of my favorite moments in real life. You know, you can go and look it up on YouTube, and um, Bernstein is just like. I don't know. He's he transcends. They are transcendent. Everything is like happening, 
And I was going, oh, hang on a second. That's what happens when Denise is in the room and all the musicians are in the room. He is our Leonard Bernstein. He's <laughs> our conductor, you know. He's, <laughs> you know, he he is that. Um, and um, for instance, that 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 rebel yell, that banshee cry of Loas, it's just at the edge of her ruining her voice forever. But, wow. you know, for, for Denis, you just want to bring that little bit of extra. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, you guys, you guys, you guys talked to him. You know, you guys had him. You know, you, 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 you know that there's a man who, who is, 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 you know, not only uh, incredibly imaginative and incredibly brilliant at his work, but there's a gentle soul in there. There's a there's a huge big heart that, that it's in his you know, eyes. That, it's in his yeah, eyes. I mean, yeah, it's, it's like you know he's he's wonderful, you know. And yet we were joking that he stopped us to say he goes I don't use the term genius that often, but but Hans Zimmer is a genius. Oh yeah, no like, no. He, he no, you us. see, he would never have said that to me because <laughs> very early on, very early on in our relationship, um, because he's so generous, you know, he's so generous, I, you know, and so so I play him something and it moves him, and then he he needs to talk about it and he needs to compliment me, and I'm going, uh, Denis, we gotta move on. You know, it's like we got a movie to do here. Um, and anyway, I get really embarrassed by compliments. So, so he said, "What, what, what, what should I say?" And I'm going, "Oh, it's it's simple, you know. It's like I play you a piece of music, and you just go, it's shit, or it's not shit. <laughs> and depending on how you say it's not shit, I will know everything about it." <laughs> has Has no one ever told you that was shit? Nah, nah, no, 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 no. I mean, look, look with Chris. It's, it's, it's quite a different. No, I mean, this thing, this this great thing about Chris. Um. So, he writes his own scripts. So does Denis. Um. And with Chris, I I love reading Chris's script because uh, I have two ways of working. Like for instance, with Denis. I didn't read the script because I knew the book so well, and it, I, I was more interested with him telling me his story, how mm -hmm. he wanted to do it. I wanted to know what was in his head. Right? With Chris, I love reading the script because I actually love love reading his writing. But then when we start working, at the beginning, I'm talking about Chris's movie, Chris's words, Chris's... I. Uh, script and then as as we go along we talk and it becomes like we're not talking about his movie or my music we're talking about the movie and the music mm -hmm. and it becomes completely uh, impersonal so we can say anything we want to each other <laughs> um and compliments are not not part of the conversation because they're you know they're they're um like they just hold up you know the you know they hold up us Getting on with things. The process. <laughs> sure. um, the process. So, 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 so the only one I'll give you is this one. Is um, you, everybody knows the story of Interstellar that he wrote a letter to me, and you know I wrote it from this from that letter. I have an Interstellar yeah. tattoo right here. It says "Stay." So I'm I'm, I'm all in oh, on this. Please, right, okay, please tell right. the story. Yes. Okay, right, right. Well, the story the story is simple. Chris and I were at a party that we didn't want to be at. Um, <laughs> So we were at, we were like in some corner while you know Rome was burning or whatever. The, I have no idea what the party was. Um, so we're talking movies, of course. We're talking, movies, of course. You know? And um, he looks at me suddenly and he sort of pulls back a little and he goes, "Would I be up for?" spending one day just writing whatever came to my mind if he sent me a letter but didn't tell me what the movie was but just wrote a fable i said yeah great adventure he actually phoned the director i was working with at that point to to ask permission that I, he could have this day and you know and the letter arrived and it's, it's this beautiful fable 
I, I'll never really tell anybody what it, it was so personal, it was so private because he knows he knows me so much and he knows my son so well. And it's mm. a, it's this beautiful fable about what it's what it is to be a father. Mm. And uh, mm. so I wrote this fragile little piece. Um, so Sunday I write, write this very fragile piece, which is the relationship between my son and me. I phone Chris's house. It's ten o'clock at night. Emma, his wife, answers. I'm going, hey, listen, I've done it. Do you want me to send it over? She goes, oh, he's curiously antsy. Um, can he come down? Very yeah, sure he can come down. So um, he comes over. I play him the thing. And he's sitting on the couch. He's sitting behind me on the couch. He's sort of leaning back like this, you know. And I'm going, well, what do you think? And he's going, hmm, suppose I better make the movie. <laughs> so I'm going, well, what is the movie? You know, because there was no clue about what the movie is. And he starts talking about space and he talk, starts talking about all that stuff. Um, and I'm going, but tell me, Chris, hang on, how does this fragile little theme relate to big rockets and time and, you know, all, all, all the stuff that you had in Interstellar, right? Um and 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 you know, at the end of the world for, for starters, he goes. Well, I now know where the heart of the movie is. So, it's a compliment. Of course, that's a compliment. But at the same mm. time, it's a very pragmatic way for him. You know, he he was struggling with the script, and it gave him. Mm. I mean, he, he he's told me he he just put put the headphones on and just just sit down and write. Right. So. Um, I'm not saying I had anything to do with writing this wonderful story and this wonderful script, but you know, part of the composer's job, and I think that part of the composer's job on Dune was as well. You know, um, inspire your director because mm. they mm. sure inspire you. You know, mm. or they yeah. challenge you, or they whatever, whatever it is. You know, it's like um, that. That that that's that's the. That's the fabulousness of the world we live in. Oh, it is. Oh. Hey, listen, wouldn't I wouldn't swap this job for anything else. Oh, no. we wouldn't want you to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm like getting teary-eyed right now, man. I've seen that movie so many times. Jake, take us, take us out. Yeah. Mr. Summer, this is this is a big epic question that really could spawn uh, your, your your entire career, but there are so many moments <laughs> of of so many of your scores that I love that have that moment that I'm waiting for, for it to hit in the movie, whether it's in Dark Knight, whether it's, forgive this, they're like, duh, 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 or that, that you know, the beautiful voice that you're talking about in the Dune score or the, you know, the Wonder Woman theme, the da na 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 So I'm sort of curious, those are, those are moments that you know as an audience we're waiting for to hit, but you have to also pick and choose just when you're going to use them. Because if you use them too much, then it kind of ruins the effect of it. So I'm sort of curious, when you know you've oh, got gold... I've seen Dune 2. We've all seen, seen it. it. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 see it yeah. twice. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know Loire's voice, her banshee cry, mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. happens twice in this one. Exactly right. right. And we were very careful about when we would bring that back. You know? So... Um, and a lot of that, in, in this case, was discussions with um, Joe Walker, mm. our editor, um, who went to music school while I didn't. So I, I <laughs> wow, I, I listened to Joe very carefully. Um, with Chris, my <laughs> first experiences with Mister Nolan was saying yes to Batman, but saying, I don't know how to do it. I think I need a friend to help me out because I can I can be the Dark Knight. I know how to be dark. I know how to do that. But I don't know how to be as elegant as Bruce Wayne is. And James says, Newton Howard. Own your friend, you know? So, but, so James was in London, but uh, Chris is phoning me because he needs a Batman thing. I'm going, uh, but I'm stuck on another movie. And he's going, look, look, just, 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 just give me 10 minutes. Just, you know, I'm having a little problem. There's a, this is, this is shot and I can't make it work. I can't, I can't, you know, get there, you know, I'm going, so what's the shot? Explain the shot to me. He goes, well, it's this very tall building and it's night and Batman standing on top of it, looking across Gotham city. I'm going, that's the, shot that is if you don't have that shot you don't have a movie 
right? <laughs> um, so so um, it's not just a trivial conversation. I think there's quite a lot of responsibility that comes with this. And and mm-hmm. he explains, you know, how how he gets to the shot, etc. Um, so I I I do write something, and you know, and then I don't know, maybe a month later, I'm finished with what I was working on. I end up in London. I'm looking at the film, and there's that shot, and there's whatever I had just whipped up in a few minutes. Actually, that's not entirely true. I probably took took some time over it, um, <laughs> and it works. You know, and it's um, so. So that is one of those moments. You know, it's it's one of those moments. But it's the it's the image and the music combined, and the image and the music um, support each other. You know, or or, or complete each other, mm. right? So, mm. and I understand. You know, look, I'll give you another. I'll give you another scene. Uh, Interstellar. Um, Matthew McConaughey is looking at the videos of his children, right? Oh, so they, I mean, literally the, one of the greatest scenes. Of, I mean, and that's the first take, right? Of McConaughey's face. It's insane. I'm sorry, right. sorry. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. So, so Chris is in Iceland. <laughs> He's fu- and he phones me up and he goes, well, I have this scene and this is what happens. And this is the first shot and this is and then that's this shot and then it followed by this shot and then this and you see this. And blah, blah, blah. Can you just write something? I'm going... This is too complicated. This is too fragile. This is too complicated. I actually have to see the picture. You've got to send me the picture. And he goes, but it's worked really well in the past, the way, you know, we <laughs> we feel time in the same way. We feel, you know, um, the, 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 the shape of a scene in the same way. Um, just give it a go. And if it doesn't work out, I'll send you the I'll send you the footage. So I write the th- I write the thing. Um, send it to Chris couple of days uh you know we were talking about something completely different and i'm going oh how did that thing work out that i sent you because well we adjusted two frames but other than that it was perfect so it was just <laughs> two frames. knowing each knowing each other you know oh knowing God. each other and him being very articulate or maybe me just listening carefully you know this is one of the things Going back to Dune, which is what we're supposed to be talking about, <laughs> working with these astonishing musicians. The thing I realize about them is it's not just that they're great players, they're great listeners. Because that's how great music sort of happens, is by listening to each other and supporting each other and getting out of each other's way and, you know, and then just sort of shoring it all up a little bit. Um and I, and I love that we, you know, we didn't do, I, I love that we didn't do a big orchestral score. I love that it became about individuals. I love that it's, 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 it's uncompromising. I love that it's abrasive. And then at the same time, it can be very beautiful. Um, I love that we went out and tortured people uh, building instruments for us and, you know, <laughs> is it ready yet? Or, you know, or, 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 you know, this amazing software right in Berlin, you know, like, why do you need five resonators? Well, because I have this sound in my head and I can't <laughs> explain it to you. I mean, the, the opening of Dune, both Dunes, you know, have that crazy voice. Yes. Mm. That was, uh, that was, I was trying to explain to Denis this idea of a voice, but how to technically do it, because mm. um, at the end of the day, I'm a failed recording engineer. Um, so I know how to do some of that stuff, but <laughs> it was impossible to explain it to him. So I said, look, let me just do it. Um, and so, so, so I made the voice, right? And it never was supposed to open the movie. It was just a, a way of, you know, the saduka could sound like this, da, da, da. You know, and then Denis and Joe came up with the idea that this was a great way to start the movie. Mm. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that sort of an idea because, look, Lion King, uh, you think uh, the children's movie Disney, da 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 da, it's going to be again, it's going to be the orchestra and it's going to be all that, um, and instead you hear this raw African voice and you instantly know. 
it's it's not that sort of a Disney movie. Mm, right, a right, one. right. Yes, you know. Yes. Um, Sherlock Holmes, I got into trouble momentarily with Warner Brothers because you know <laughs> Warner Brothers big, again. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a big Christmas. It's a big Christmas movie. And I, I got out of tune pianos and banjos, and you know, ba banjo banjo is about the most. Um, you know the definition of a gentleman. A gentleman is somebody who who knows how to play the ban banjo but refrains from doing so. <laughs> so you know, I got banjos everywhere, <laughs> and and and, and it, it was loathed for a while by by certain executives, truly loathed. Mm. You know, and then we and then then we did a preview, and the audience loved it. At which point, I got to carry on doing it. And then I just I just remember opening the script for the second Sherlock Holmes movie, whatever it was called. And the first line was, interior, the gypsy cam. I thought, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Guy Ritchie, man, that's awesome. Yeah, that's no, Guy loved what I was doing, you know? I mean, that was the thing. You know, Guy loved it. Yeah. But, you know, uh, it's like... Go on. Oh, I was oh, just going to say we're running out of time. I we, wish we had we, more time. We have you. so many questions. <laughs> yeah. and we're running out of time yeah. with you, man. I'll ask me whatever you want. Well, I, I, as we start to wrap you up, I want to ask you, after the first Dune, you said you were obsessed and you just kept writing. Is that the same with post, you know, part two? Are you thinking about Messiah at all, which would be a no, completely, course, totally different piece? Of course I am, and of course I will, and of course... Right now, I can't because I'm in, as you know, as I'm talking to you, I'm in that circle of, you know, still, you know, the, the, the afterburner of, of Dune part two, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and, um, and you're touring again soon. I'm touring yeah. again, but, 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 but that's not just, you know, and I got a couple of other movies on my plate, but that's not just it. It's just like, We are weird. We are weird. You know, Denis and I, I think it, I don't think he will mind me saying this. We were so nervous before the New York premiere. You know, will they like it? Will they, won't they like it? You know, mm. so now, now everybody's going on about, you know, how, how much people want to go and see it. You know, and tomorrow's Friday, tomorrow it opens. And I'm going, what if nobody comes? You know, I mean, seriously, <laughs> I mean, it's like we are, that, that's how I feel. That's how I feel, right. you know. So right. I can't quite think about the next one because I'm still in the in the sort of the whirlwind or the maelstrom or the hurricane <laughs> of, you know, the sandstorm, probably more appropriately. <laughs> of, very of accurate, world. very on yeah. brand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Dimmer, Mr. Dimmer, I can't not ask you this before you go, because what you did with Josh Brolin, I, I just love that collaboration and him playing the ballast set and kind of how we're introduced to his character in this new one with the song that he's playing. And I know that he worked with you on that. Um, and I find that to be interesting because as a composer, when you get to work with an actor, I mean, I, I was just curious what that relationship is like. And did it open you up a little bit more in terms of how you do scores having an actor well, work on, with you? We've written quite a few songs together. Yeah. Because right. there were quite a few songs in the first one, except they got ditched. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, right. and, 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 and maybe, maybe, maybe we need to make an album together. Um, Yes. I don't know. He's just a he's just a delightful he's a delightful poet, right? But he, look, he's a good, great poet. Great poet. You know, he sees himself as a poet. So you know um, this, right, Mr. Zimmer? You know yeah, this book, exactly, Greg right. Fraser. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, actually, you know, uh, he sort of mentions it, but he doesn't quite mention it. I saw the little interview where he mentions about writing with me, you know, and me sending him pictures of of icebergs. Well. <laughs> When he asked me to, when Denise said, "Can can I can I go and write with him?" I was in Antarctica. <laughs> I was about as as opposite to the desert and heat <laughs> and everything <laughs> that you can imagine, you know. Um, uh, yeah, and I kept sending him pictures of, "Hey, don't you think this? Don't you think the penguins are cute? You know, and stuff like that." <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and, and he thought I lost it. And he was probably right. 
Um, but but then yeah no no but then it 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 it, it all came together pretty quick. Um, no pro no problem. I mean it, it's okay. So you're dealing with people working in 120 degrees in these suits. Um, sand gets in everywhere. It's the most uncomfortable experience. And the only way they can survive it is by being making jokes, being fun, supporting each other, being a family, you know, and th that's really how, you know, to answer your question, you know, if Josh would go, hey, let's go into an album, I'd go, yeah, let's start now, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, there are things which go across, you know, yes, yet again, we're talking about time in a Chris Nolan type way. <laughs> I mean, my career in Hollywood really started off because Barry Levinson gave me a chance on Rain Man. Oh. And now Zendaya, of course, is doing Euphoria with Barry Levinson's son. So mm -hmm. there is this, this generational thing that's going on and we can talk about I don't know what, you know, we can talk about why us and why these people and how does all this happen? And, you know, how how come we were so lucky? How, how, how come we, you know, I mean, I can pinpoint the moment, you know, I can pinpoint the moment that Barry Levinson's wife, Diana, went to see a tiny little movie I did in London and bought him the CD for the soundtrack and he felt she didn't need to buy him the CD. She could have just said, oh, yeah, I saw a cool movie and quite liked the music. But, you know, mm -hmm. she bought him the CD. He was in London. He knocked on my door. So it's all about luck. It's all about timing. You know, there, 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 there are thousands of great composers out there. On the other hand, when I was working at DreamWorks, and this is probably naughty to say, um, I was on the same corridor... My office basically was at the, at the same corridor as the other end was John's writing room. And I had taken this job of head of music, which basically because I thought there are thousands of composers who never get a shot and never get listened to. And every tape that was sent to me, not everyone, but most of them sounded like John Williams. And I kept thinking, why are they sending that? Don't they know that Steven Spielberg can just walk down the corridor and go, Hey John, <laughs> can you write something? <laughs> you know, yeah. Why, yeah, yeah. You know, so so we were definitely the wrong place to send us and send John Williams sound alike scores to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Zimmer, if you can't tell, we could go on all day talking to you. It is nothing short of an honor. Um, in the spirits of you and Mr. Nolan, I would like to end by asking you this interview: shit or not shit? Not shit. Not shit. <laughs> yes, we got yeah. fantastic. No, I, Thank no, you. I love you guys because you love film. Yeah, you know, simple well, we as do. that. You know, we do, and, it's, and this is the reason we started this show. No, we started, you, started the show that, to highlight you, highlight people like yeah, you in the industry. No, yeah. it's, uh, well, maybe, but I, um, uh, my answer would be slightly different. I think what, what you're doing is you're protecting a part of the uh, of what makes us human part of what makes us culturally relevant part of 20 you know 20th century storytelling that needs to carry on and 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 needs to get and it's constantly being refined i mean you know it's it's it's, it's great the technology that we have but you know it needs people fighting for it because hey it's really the easiest thing in my world and in your world is people saying no you know, no, they don't want to do this. No, that's too dangerous. That's too risky. You know, we. I carried on writing uh, after we finished the first part, even though we weren't greenlit on the second part. But I'm, I'm a tenacious bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We do it because we yeah. love it. We don't know what else to do. Okay. I, I, I understand there where you you're go. coming from in that perspective. Thank, thank you for being you on our show. It's a pleasure to talk thank to you. you. Congratulations Take on the care. score and can't wait to get the vinyl. Sit the thank head. you. Okay, we sincerely have to thank our good friends at Warner Brothers um, who have oh gone gosh. above and beyond to get us the incredible talent that we've had on behalf of their film, Dune Part 2. 
uh, a film that I personally uh, assume is going to be part of our Oscar conversation <laughs> next year, uh, right around this time. So so book it. Uh, but they managed to get us time with uh, Denis Villeneuve, uh, Rebecca Ferguson, Hans Zimmer. And um, we got Greg Frazier on our own. I'm going to claim that one as, as as ours. But thank you so much for all of the push that they did. Zimmer, I mean, what do you say about him? Honestly, I mean, he's as a composer, he's such a gifted storyteller. He's the kind of guy who I could sit and just listen yeah. to him talk for hours at a time. Um, he's he always strikes me as a guy who's just laid back and in the pocket and ready to entertain at a moment's notice. Like, imagine a, a dinner with him, you know. And uh, and so and it's funny because a lot of times we do get to talk to these composers and they all kind of strike me that way. Uh, Daniel Pemberton comes across as a really mm. colorful guy who tells great stories. Michael Giacchino, when we've had him on the show, has been this gregarious dude who's been able to, like, bust out props from his, you know, his Ludwig show was great, life. too. Yeah. L- Ludwig Gornson, who just ended up winning the real. Oh, God, I Michelle got so tired of me uh, throughout the telecast being like, hey, that's a real blend guest. <laughs> <laughs> real blend guest Ludwig Gornson. Hey, that's horrible. Hoida, then Hoida he was on Roland. <laughs> I was like, enough, shut up. Yeah. Um, Jiggy, what's your takeaway from having Zimmer back on the show? You know, the crazy thing is, I feel like it's a, it's a twofold example. Um, but as we were all preparing questions for, for Zimmer, you kind of, especially when you interview a legend, you kind of go back on their on their IMDb filmography to kind of be reminded of, of everything that he's done over the course of his career. And, and sometimes you look for, uh, you know, an anniversary year, which is always a good excuse to think of something. And, uh, you know, one of the downsides was that, you know, in addition to obviously wanting to talk about Dune Part 2, there were... 30 other credits to his name that I wanted to find some sort of an excuse to to bring up, whether, you know, was the anniversary of The Lion King or, or just wanting to bring up, you know, 10,000 other pieces of music. You know, I, I, I always think his score from The Rock is super underrated. Um, yeah. But and you just don't have time. You, you don't have time to get to everything that you want to, which is a testament to his filmography. But one of the cool things I discovered is that he's such a brilliant storyteller that in order to sometimes make the points that he wants to make, he'll call back to some of the the iconic scores that he made. And the crazy Mm -hmm. thing was a lot of the things that I wanted to ask him about or that you wanted to ask him about Sean or that Kevin did, we didn't get to ask, but he still talked about, like I I really wanted to ask a a Lion King question because that's a, I mean, I'd say it's an underrated score, he won an Oscar for it. So like, let's, yeah. you know, let's, let's, yeah, yeah. let's, you know, but you know, when you, when, I feel like when you're talking about the great Zimmer scores, people don't often list Lion King necessarily up there. He brought that up by himself. I, I think of, um, yeah, have you guys seen that, that meme of the dude playing the piano on the beach and the piano's on fire? Yeah, and yeah. oftentimes the caption is like, for, for example, here, it would be like, hey, Hans, it's just a cartoon about lions. Don't get crazy. <laughs> and, then, and then it's Hans Zimmer gets him on the, you know, yeah, so yeah. that's kind of what I picture, you know, whenever I think of, of him with the Lion King. But, uh, you know, it's, it's so funny. Um, I, I was just in L.A. Uh, covering Kung Fu Panda 4, which like, you know, I, I, I went in to see it. I enjoyed it. It was fun. But there are a couple of moments where I was like, damn, the score is pretty good. Who? Dude did this. And <laughs> yeah. I looked it up and wouldn't you know, it's our it's yeah. our good friend, the Zimster. Yeah, so yes, like, you know, even, even, <laughs> even like he doesn't phone it in, whether it's you know, Dune Part, you know, one that he's winning an Oscar for or Kung Fu Panda Four, he's he's given it he's given it his all. You know, it's and it's it's remarkable. And and the fact that we can I don't know, Gabe, was it you said forty five minutes? The fact that we can go forty five right. minutes and it's just sort of I feel like we barely chipped the tip of the iceberg that's sticking out of the water, not even the rest of it that's hidden below. Uh, it's a testament to, you know, it, it doesn't matter how long we would have had with him. It wouldn't have been enough if, if we yeah. had done a, a four hour long sit down, you know, marathon of an interview. We still would have walked away going, ah, I can't believe we didn't bring this up or ah, I can't, you know, I know. And, and, and all we can do is hope that we have him on again. We also got, I think, really lucky both times and that we didn't, you know, it'd be great to sit with him in person. Those mm-hmm. are always have a different vibe to them. But I think we're lucky not getting him at the junket in person because sure. both both of our interviews with him were, were on Zoom. But he was like in his studio or somewhere. Mm-hmm. He was very relaxed. It was very casual. I think both times it was kind of later in the evening yeah. for him. And that energy, I think, is good for the way he tells stories, the way he talks about, the way he answers questions for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just made it feel very special where, like, you're five minutes in and you're just kind of relaxing with 
with Hans Zimmer and and he's just yeah. telling you about this is how Nolan um came to me with with the Interstellar yeah. pitch and oh you're like God. keep going yeah, <laughs> yeah. keep and, going and, and the it, it's also too um just a little sort of behind the scenes we recorded this interview uh the day before uh our 300th episode dropped mm. so you know we were all already kind of i think at least i was sort of in my feelings about the show and 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 getting very reflective and you know anytime we hit those milestones it's, it's hard not to you know, take pause and, and, you know, if, if only for a moment, give ourselves a, a little pat on the back. So, you know, the fact that I was already in that mindset that day anyway, uh, coupled with an interview from one of my you know favorite composers of all time in which he wraps up the interview by calling my friends and myself, uh, you <laughs> know, some of the saviors of cinema, which look, I, I we, we joke when we say it's, that. It's, and, us, and by, you know, it's us. It's us. And it's Tom Cruise. That's exactly that's, right. That's, that's exactly what we always right. say. That's what we so, always say. You know, it, it, look, we're, we're, not, we're not, we're not, uh, um, you know, conceited enough to, to necessarily buy into that, but, um, it's a fact, very well, sweet thing to say. Yeah, yeah. It was a Speak very for sweet yourself. thing to say. <laughs> it was a very sweet thing to say by a guy who we all admire, and the fact that it was said on a day when we were already feeling very reflective about uh, some of the accomplishments that we made on the show. It, it just, it just, it coupled for a, a very, a very uh, sweet moment, a very great, great afternoon. It also strikes me too how humble he is. I mean, mm -hmm. he's Hans Zimmer for God's sakes. And if you remember the beginning of the interview, you bring up the Empire Strikes Back question. And he he's like one of the very few people that he could say this about where he was like he starts to talk about John Williams. And he's like, first yeah. off, let's just let's just clear things up. John Williams is such a better composer than I am. And I was like, you're, you're Hans Zimmer. Yeah. What are you talking about? But he's John Williams. But, but it's right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, if you were going Williams, to make exactly. any argument about like who's who's taking up the John Williams mantle. Sure. Hans Zimmer, it was would probably lead that conversation. And look, I'm, yeah, you know, I, I, I would imagine that, that Zimmer want he does you know zimmer probably doesn't want to be the next john williams he wants to be the first right. Hans zimmer which you know it's it's fair in its own right but in you know when you're when you're talking about the greats and and the reason i consider john williams obviously for so many reasons to be the great is that i can go to my mom and who maybe doesn't know who john williams is and sing a couple of themes and she'll know sure. exactly what they know and and i think mm -hmm. we're at a point where we're starting to get to where with zimmer where you can sort of whistle a few few things sure. and and um and and know and know what they are. I think you're right though. Like one is not the next, the other. They you're, are both yeah. individual. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, exactly. Exactly. Completely untouchable different. legacies. Yeah. Exactly right. But it's been exciting to see some some of the up and comers. Um and, and I think our friend Ludwig uh, yeah. Gorenson mm -hmm. is one of I those mean, who won an Oscar. I mean he's arrived. Yeah. For his work uh, in Oppenheimer. So let's use that to transition into the Oscars telecast. So it's yes, it's um Friday, if it were, whenever you're listening to this, but I will uh, clue you in on a little behind the scenes. We are recording this on Monday, the day after the Oscars telecast, and it's so it's very fresh. And we in our still memory. want to talk about it, damn it. And we do, because we kind of think if you're listening to the show, you would like to hear our take on the ceremony. God, we've been talking about it since essentially July. When <laughs> How well, long until we start uh, talking about the next one? Uh, well, I mean, Dune just came out. We, uh, let's talk did. about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I want to start by saying that I um, completely changed my approach to how I was going to talk about the telecast because early on, and the guys will tell you in the text thread, I was aggressive and angry. Um, I thought that the telecast got off to a terrible start. Uh, I thought the jokes to kick off were mean and i don't mind mean humor you know i'm I'm okay with it but it felt like specifically i'm gonna i'm gonna stop on how long jimmy kimmel lingered on robert downey jr yeah i hated that if i'm being honest with you i genuinely it, I genuinely it like feels it, 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 sorry it feels like every year there's there's something like that where it's like it it sticks out as a sore thumb and it it's weird to me that there's not like an earlier out like you would think that you would as you're writing the show you'd go this is a bit of an aggressive bit any yeah. point along this, here's your out. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. like when this stops I mean, working, here's your out. And maybe and that's you know, what the dog bit was, but he, he just <sighs> missed, you know, but, read but, it. You know, Downey and Kimmel have such a great. I mean, Downey always goes on Kimmel's show. Yeah. Like they have a great relate. You know, this is not some. This is not Joe Coy getting up in front of a bunch of celebrities who he's probably never met before and and trying right. out humor. Like this is like I would probably go as far as saying they're at least professional friends. But mm -hmm. but like I mean, come on, like the dude's been 
sober for literally decades now. You know, and the I mean, joke has been made. Like, the yeah, joke's that's been made. what yeah. it is. That's, like, yeah. you, I, I'm not saying that Robert Downey Jr. is untouchable. Like, of course, go after the guy. But if you're going to go after him, can you, can you get it something fresher than yeah. his 20 year old addiction that he's been yeah. beyond and, and rehabbed? My, it just felt so out of place. Well, that's how I felt sort of about the um, and, you know, it's so funny. I literally had a moment before the show yesterday where I thought, you know, thank goodness it's it's Kimmel hosting because I can't handle another. Oh, the movies are so long, bit because I, feel I like do like Kimmel. Yeah. Every, I, do, I do like Kimmel, but I feel like the the joke about how long the movies are. I mean, haven't we been doing that for thirty years? Like I, at this point, like that feels like one of the most tired cliche movie host bits you can do. Yeah. And whenever he launched into Killers of the Flower Moon is so long that by the time the movie starts, you could go to Oklahoma. And I'm like, are, like, how often do we have to hear jokes? Yes, the movies are long, but you're also you're also saying that to a room full of people who like great long movies and also to your to an audience who has no problem watching six hours of a of a uh, of a TV miniseries in a row. Like, I'm sorry, yeah, like, it's just a weird... the, the movies are too long bit is just antiquated. I was at a it. I was at a viewing party and someone um, someone mentioned they were like, oh, Oppenheimer getting, you know, nominated for editing. They're like, how's a three hour movie, you know, get nominated for editing? And I was like, I'm pretty sure this three hour movie is about to win. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, because it's great and it's really well edited and it's a yeah. story that could have been 12 hours long. That's, like, it, yeah, it's well, not about also, it's not like about whatever, whittling. It's yeah. about, you know, it's about so much I, more than that. I feel like that's a joke people say whenever they don't have an understanding of what editing actually sure, is. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. In the same way, like Killers of the Flower Moon got editing and yeah, and it was a three and a half hours like the link of the film it goes back to that old roger ebert quote which is no right. good no good movie is long enough and no bad movie is short enough you know right. we I, have watched 90 minute movies that feel three and a half hours I, and i'm sorry killers of the flower moon felt like a two-hour movie i think too many people think of editing as a technical uh, yes. skill and not a creative storytelling exactly. skill which it right. very much is it's rewriting right. the movie for the third and final time you know yeah um and i think that i think it's hard to see that i think it's hard one i don't think there's a lot of open conversation it's harder to find editors talking sure. about storytelling and filmmakers yeah. talking about finding the story with an editor but there's so much more to yeah oh how do you make this flow better how's the pacing right and also like well no we, we were shaving off frames at a time yeah. so that this reaction hit yeah. better. you know like things yeah, like mean, that that are well, it's not just well, technical Gabe, you're an editor and you, you know this you know and I, I edit my own pieces uh here at fox and and by no means am i trying to compare you know, me putting, you know, a, a length or a special or a package or something together compared to editing Oppenheimer. Um, but, you know, there's a there's like an emotional there's an emotional Good, I'm glad um, way you that you know, that. But, there, but there really is. So, you know, like during the during the pandemic, when I spent, you know, three, four months working on that that boogeyman horror movie monster uh, piece, uh-huh. there's this there's this almost path that you follow where you, you, you get like really good when you're editing and then you get to the point when you're editing where you go like i hate my life why did i even start this is the right. worst thing i've ever worked on my entire life and you just want to deassemble the whole thing and and then you kind of like work on it you kind of power through that and you kind of and, and it's just sort of like it's 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 a really creative and oftentimes emotionally draining it's it is not just clipping 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 it is it is taking a, a multiple pieces of clay and forming a sculpture and halfway through yeah. hating the sculpture that you're working on I for, and, and continuously molding it. I forget exactly what he says. Scorsese has a quote where he's like, um, if you're not like sick to your stomach when you're editing your movie, like there's something wrong with you. He, yeah. he, mm-hmm. he has like a more eloquent way of putting it, but he yeah. talks about like every time he's made some of the greatest movies in cinema history. Sure. And each each of those times he's been sick to his stomach and hated sure. it and thought that he was yeah. terrible, you know? Yeah. So back to Kimmel just for a second. Um, I think the show redeemed itself when when... As as is the case with the host almost all the time, when they take a backseat to the movies in question, and and we've talked a bit this year about how the movies that were being honored were, you know, probably one of the strongest groups that we've seen in in many a year, and I I think that that started to be reflected when people got up and to me gave some of the most emotional speeches that I've seen in a really long time. Partly, I'm going to credit that to this format that I just really love which is previous hosts or previous winners coming out and and recognizing uh the people who are being nominated uh I, i'm gonna get i'm gonna jump right to the best actress one by the time jessica lang is is you know uh giving carrie mulligan all of this praise 
I'm watching Carrie Mulligan and waiting to see when she's going to crack because I'm tearing up, you know, and getting all choked up at this at this praise. And when the person has like a direct relationship, like I, th I think of Sally Field talking to Emma Stone, like Emma Stone sitting there hearing this from someone she must have idolized as a kid growing up. Now, all of those didn't work. You know, there were clearly some people who were put up there who didn't have a, a strong connection to the people that they were recognizing. But when it worked, I thought it really worked. And and I'm going to vote for that format to just stay in place. I think yeah. it's I think it's tremendous. But I will say it and I don't I don't dislike it like it, it yielded some really great moments. Um, the downside of that is, is that we don't get clips of the acting. And that's always been one of my pet peeves is whenever we're telling people how great these performances are. But at no point mm -hmm. do we ever show them because, look, yeah, we've seen Anatomy of a Fall and and we've seen Sterling K. Brown in, in American fiction. But like there's a good chance that the average person at home hasn't seen all the acting nominees, if not some of them. And I feel like it'd be beneficial to show, you know, so often, you know, I've always argued the relevancy of award shows is to not, not to uh, entertain the people who are already, you know, sold, uh, but the people who maybe have never heard of anatomy of a fall, but then see that really great acting clip and they go, okay, well, I gotta, I gotta see that. Or like mm -hmm. someone go, wait, wait, why, why, you know, it, the thing, my, my girlfriend still has not seen Oppenheimer, but like, you know, it's so funny. She, every time, even though we've watched a couple of award shows together, she always goes, oh yeah, he isn't Robert Downey Jr. Is in, in Oppenheimer, <laughs> right? And like, it'd be mm -hmm. nice if like we showed some clips of, you know, but the thing yeah. is you can't do both. Like it, like, you know, the, the five past winners already extends that that segment enough and sure. you can't do that plus show a clip and it's right. it's a have your cake and eat it too it's a really sweet moment but i do think it does um the movies a disservice by not showing clips of their performances can i ask you guys a question to kind of move on from that i agree with that is the honoring the the stunt community with a with a reel is that a hey is this enough or is that a hey we're gonna add a category so. yeah I, I couldn't tell if it it, it was either a really poorly devised uh, slap in the face or right. them testing the water. But the thing is like, what do they need to test the waters for? Like people have been screaming yeah. that they want a stunt category for years. Like they don't need to create this segment just to, to then sort of peek behind the curtain and go, okay, how right. do people respond to that? What my, yeah. what I'm hoping for is that they see that and they want that and whatever process has to go into making that happen is happening. You know, like I don't know the, the bureaucracy behind that. And this was, my hope is this was a we see you, we agree, this is like a very important thing. And and here's what we can do is we can include it in our telecast to some degree. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that means it's coming. I hope that means that the people behind the scenes that are making the show and in the academy are like, yeah, that's kind of insane. Yeah. That, I mean, this is a very morbid thing to say, but I we had this discussion at the viewing party I was at about why it's not. And it's kind of insane that like throughout the history of cinema, but in modern time, you know, the last like 50 years, like the people that literally give their lives making mm -hmm. movies are the stunt people. Like, sure. like those are the people that risk the most and that they're mm -hmm. not, we talk about how hard acting is and oh, the yeah. water was cold. And you're like, yeah, like, so was the car exploding yeah, that you yeah. were flying off a cliff in, you know, like it's, it's, uh, it is just a weird, it's a weird blank spot. It also, so it's getting, <clears throat> It also gives the Academy and that telecast an opportunity to recognize a lot of these tentpole films that don't get into the conversation that Oscar seems to constantly be courting, mm -hmm. you know, some way, somehow, like next year, let's say it's Furiosa, you know, and and the stunt people for Dune Part Two and maybe the fall guy or something like that, that that's up there, you know, one year, whatever, it's the next mission that's out there and and you're putting those titles uh, front and center. I'm not saying it's going to get more people to tune in, but yeah. um, speaking of so, testing the waters, I would like to ask, do you guys think that and I always wonder this and it, it never really is the case. But whenever um, they give a comedian uh, a, a chance to mm. sort of deliver a little mini monologue before presenting an award, I always sort of wonder, is this like a low key audition to see how people respond to hosting? And I can't help but wonder, mm. like. John Mulaney would do a great job. I mean, he's, he's, he's got history hosting. Was it the spirit awards? Yeah, um, I mean, he's so has I, he I written to his, the Oscars before? 
It wouldn't surprise me. He's written, you know, he wrote for, for SNL for years and, um, you know, and, and that, uh, that, um, feel the dream sketch I thought he did was fantastic. He I, did a similar, I figured you um, love that, yeah. yeah, he, well, he did a similar bit. Um, he, did, he has one of his stand up specials. Um, he did a similar bit about the fugitive where he sort of runs every, he keeps trying to like deliver a speech, but it keeps going back to like talk about the plot of the fugitive. Um, <laughs> I, I think he would be fantastic. And, and, you know, if, if Kimmel's at a point where, you know, he, four is enough for him, Mulaney would be an incredible, uh, yeah. You know, out. you know who else would be a fantastic swap out? Ryan fucking Gosling, because Ryan Gosling can so do good. everything. Yeah, there's everything. I mean, I it, someone tweeted it. I wish I could remember who it was. It was the perfect summation. It's it was a picture of him performing. Mm-hmm. I'm just Ken. And it said, when you lose the Oscar, yeah, but you win that. the show, yeah. you win the show. I mean, it, 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 he to me was the highlight yeah. of embracing that song. You know, and all of its yeah. lunacy. But I thought that that and maybe it's just the, the way that it timed out to this show. The humor throughout the show was weird, weird in a in an OK way. Yeah. <laughs> like I was I, the John I mean, Cena I bit. I haven't said this, but like, John Cena loved the show. What, oh, okay. You didn't love it? I, I, I didn't love it. I didn't love it. Oh. I, mean, I, 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 you know, it's so funny. I kind of felt bad because you were texting so many moments last night that brought tears to your eyes. And, yeah. and this show did not hit me the way so many moments um, involving everything everywhere all at once hit me the year before. Like really? to me, nothing hit the high, the, you know, the highs of like a Kihoi Kwan winning Best Supporting Actor or, or a Jamie Lee Curtis or, or Michelle Yeoh. Like I, okay. I, I didn't have like there were a couple of moments where I was like, oh, that was a good, you know, I love Davine Joy Randolph's speech. There are a couple of moments where I was like, okay, that's a good, that was a good moment. Um, you know, I, th- I thought the John Cena thing was, was really funny. Um, and it yeah. could have been a disaster, but I thought it was yeah. handled so well. Um, and, and yeah, the, the, I'm just Ken was really great, but overall I, I found it to be an incredibly, in, which sucks considering how much I love the movies that were awarded. I found it yeah. to be a very forgettable broadcast. Interesting. Mm. See, it, I think the show is at a point where it can only do so much right it, it's it's still going to butt up against the fact that the show ultimately is too long mm-hmm. that there's going to be high highlights and, and then dips you know sure. throughout the course of it and I, I guess i give it credit for having to go through the checklist of items it feels like it has to do um the musical numbers the immemorium you know and i'm not yeah. saying that any of those need to the go sure categories but, but you get to them and you're just like okay now it's time for this yeah and so Ultimately, what pulled me through were the speeches. Um, and I thought that uh, Nolan's speech was really nice. It's a great speech. Um, yeah. Yeah. I thought that Jonathan Glazer's speech was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought Emma Stone's speech was remarkable. Mm-hmm. I thought her getting so emotional. Yeah. I honestly don't believe that she thought she was going to win. Uh, I, I honestly believe that she thought yeah. it was Lily Gladstone's and honestly, like, and Not, not that this, these sort of things are important, but like that her dress being broken moment was just so Emma Stone. It was so yeah. like just a mm-hmm. reminder of like, oh, she's, you know, it's, it's such a like a cliche expression, but like stars, they're just like us. Like, you know, my, my dress would break in that moment kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. I don't disagree. And I, I never, you know, I, I think I texted you guys halfway through the show and I was like, I feel like the show just hasn't had, like, honestly, I, I put together, um, I did a million segments on my morning show today about, you know, the speeches and the moments. And I had a hard, I had a hard time pulling together some of the, like I pulled yeah. some speeches from like the, the winners that everyone wanted to. And I pulled John Cena and I pulled the Trump moment, you know, with, with the review for Trump and I pulled, you know, obviously I'm just Ken, but for the most part, I, I feel like I didn't have a lot to really go like, Oh my God, look, as opposed to last year, I feel like I had so many. And also yeah, I think maybe a part of it was not loving Kimmel's um, opening monologue. And mm-hmm. then he didn't really come back with like any, great bits like do you remember and, and and again this made the show go long but do you remember like that bit that he did a few years ago when they brought like the tour guide yeah, yeah, you know, like yeah. the tour group and yeah to and they yeah, like, yeah, and yeah, yeah. like taking pictures yeah. like i like little yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. you know, the, uh, know that, that the margarita show, bit with but, guillermo actually was was part of the tequila bit with, with yeah uh, but it just also fab you know it's just all like you know that you know, but it, the fact that it was br- like he was breaking the people around him were genuinely laughing yeah. like for me like <laughs> that was yeah uh because i think it was was he sitting next to coleman domingo yeah, and, he yeah. Got, and getting yeah, people's yeah. names wrong, and, and he was just cracking yeah. up. He was like, "I like tequila." <laughs> it was just yeah. like, it was, it was, just was anyone anyone else teased for a heartbeat when the show opened and Kimmel was in Barbie sitting next to her on the bench? That I thought we were going to get an old school Billy Crystal. I did. So, I definitely did. I, I didn't. But like, as a host, to like 
how much I know he's not the only one who's ever done that, but I think it is so associated with Billy Crystal. And yeah. as a comedian, like, how do you do that without just thinking I'm just ripping off another comedian, which is one of the worst things so. you can do as a comedian, you know, just. You yeah. Know. But, but that, that to me I, I is like a fun way to honor. Yeah. You know, that's a fun way to honor yeah. the, the the movies that are being recognized. Yeah. yeah. And, and that one I, was I, so well edited. The whole like, um, you're so beautiful. I know I haven't eaten yeah. in three weeks. Like it was it was <laughs> very, very well done. See, I think he can, in a Billy Crystal-esque kind of way, find the way to to find the humor in those moments, you know, yeah. if they were to insert him into each of the, the different movies. But you're right. I guess there's an element of uh, of him copying. Was there any winner? So my my winner uh, or, or lack of winner that made me so angry, and this is part of the reason why I was upset with the show in the beginning, is Spider-Verse losing oh in best best animation and listen i i understand the boy in the heron is miyazaki and i understand I many say, people I mean, believe it's, that it's, it's if it's gonna lose to anybody yeah uh, yeah that's yeah. fine yeah but that fucking movie is i mean across uh, and not just as but a there's, a, there's another one coming <laughs> and that's the first half of the you know i think that they're the, i understand uh, the that oscars argument has that the oscars has that I, to me it seems they, they have that sort of bias of like well there's another but Gabe, one we'll what if the third one doesn't up. happen what if it never happens i agree with you but i think that that's you know that's the game they play as well are we honoring the movie you know are they going to do that to do in part two because denis might do messiah that's you know, my concern like, that's my concern so did oh, you guys have a really a, quick side a winner or a loser messiah. that you were oh oh well go ahead well, well, I, was we'll say, I, I just read a really interesting um, article. I think it was like Hollywood Reporter or Variety that that uh, brought concern about Dune Part Three because it it very much made a comparison between um, for people who've read Dune Messiah. The Dune Messiah is significantly closer to uh, Godfather Part Three than it is Return of the King. Okay, um, mm, interesting. And and it really sort of made me think like either it's going to be a much different movie than we all think it's going to be, or Denis is just going to have to make some shit up. Because the, the point that it brings up is that Doom Messiah doesn't really have big action set pieces and mm-hmm. it takes place uh, 12 years after the original. And it's more like, um, uh, you know, Paul is emperor now and a, and a heavy lies ahead that wears the crown sort of thing. Like it, it drew some really interesting parallels to Godfather Part Three. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it basically brought up this idea that that for people who are expecting a return of the king, big, huge, it all comes together kind of epic thing. If that's the case, then he's literally going to have to make stuff like like Lady Jessica, Rebecca Ferguson is not in Dune Messiah. She's not in it. Yeah. yeah so like he's going to have to like create a plot line for her. Uh, you know, like he's he might have to just pull some stuff out of thin air and get creative um, short of creating a, a disappointing third installment. I think it'll probably be it won't be called Dune Messiah. I think it'll probably be called Dune Part Three. I was and wondering. I, and that. I think that that'll be. It, does he call it Dune Part Three? I think it's I mean, if it's if that's the route, like if that is true, especially if it's it's going to have to make a lot of changes. Um, but I, I feel like it it was already on that track because I think that with part one and part two, he was trying sure. to incorporate the goal of Messiah. Sure. So like he doesn't need to create the exclamation point. Right. Um, that's this fair. Is a cautionary yeah. And tale. also to, you know, with with Anya Taylor Joy and, um, you know, that was always wildly different. Yeah. And um, and how they they leave um, Chani at the end of, of right. the movie versus mm-hmm. the end of the book. I think yeah. you're not right. Sorry. I derailed us. But I just thought that was a really interesting comparison that that, that it drew the line between um, Godfather well, Part Three. While we're on this conversation. He does not end Dune Part Two in a way that has you saying, "Well, that could be the end if you want it to be." <laughs> like, no. To paraphrase, they very clearly are like, "This yeah. is the beginning of the war." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, which is uh, which is like, basically just the oh. new version of Zendaya basically looking at camera and saying, "This is only the beginning." I'm curious yeah. how. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious how it's going to go because I think a lot of people. I've been listening to a lot of people that don't know, like, haven't read the books or anything, and they're sure. all really attached to the idea of these other houses. Like, I hear a lot of people mm-hmm. talking about like, "Ooh." who are the famous actors that are going to play the leaders of mm. these other houses? And they're like very like game of Thrones mm. type mm. Um, expectations. So yeah, I mean the movie just came out, so I guess, you know, we have, sure. we have plenty also, of time. I, I, I hope he makes both, something else first. Yeah. He needs, he needs a, that, that man needs a brand. I mean, he do even think about it, like even Nolan put movies in between each Batman movie. So like yeah. he, he deserves, a this break. one makes yeah. sense. The, you know, yeah. part one, part two, yeah. you know, yeah. it worked, whatever they did work. Yeah. But yeah. And, and there's supposed to be a time gap between, Dune and Dune Messiah. So yeah, let, it's not a bad let thing. Timothy age up a little bit, you know, yeah. give him an extra couple of years. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that. So what do we what do we want to say? Six years before? Uh maybe five. Sure. Five. I think yeah. the next movie he makes he can do in, in two sure. years. You know, it's like if yeah. it's something especially if it's something he yeah. already has mostly. I'd written. I'd love a um a uh, like a 
prisoners kind of kind of movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Or, yeah. Or even like a standalone sci-fi arrival type yeah. film. Yeah. Any or other, a yeah. Denis rom com. Is it known as Denis <laughs> Denis rom com with Josh Brolin and I bet it would be a fantastic. Yeah. Actually, it'd be amazing. Yeah, uh, I would love to see him try anything. All right, Gabe. So let's get to the results of the Oscar wager. <laughs> I do know that they were. I do. I'm still not convinced that you. I I know you missed. No, on, I mean, this, on is Lily, the, this is the but, worst I've ever. I missed on production design. I missed on costume. This is the worst I've ever done. Well, but I think we all missed on a few. So, but so, Kevin, so. I think, won some good ones. The in last place. We'll start with the last place. Oh no! Confirming his worst performance yet, with thirteen correct categories, is Jake Hamilton. Yeah, thirteen? Did you yeah, miss? I missed, I missed. No, I missed uh, effects because I picked the creator instead of Godzilla. I did um, too. I missed sound, um, which I think was a big one because I put Oppenheimer instead uh-huh. of Zone of Interest. Oh, I think I did too. So I, I didn't missed, do much better. Than I missed did production I design and and costume. Um, I missed I missed actress, which yeah. Sean, didn't you? I think I think Sean, I think yeah, Sean's the only one that got actress. Yeah. I don't no. think we're weighted. No, no, no. We should maybe we should be. <laughs> um, Sean was just ahead with 14. Correct. OK, thank but you, taking, Emma Stone. But taking home. Yes, with with Emma Stone. <laughs> taking home the crown, though, was Kevin with 16. Correct. He only missed no one okay. him. four. <laughs> he can never know. <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, when he yeah. got Zone of Interest for sound, I he was got like, Zone of Interest and he got uh, Godzilla minus one for uh, yes. special effects. Yeah, did he really? Mm-hmm. Oh, good for him. That's great. Yeah. All right, good for Kevin. That was uh, big. We owe him in and out next time we're all in Los Angeles. Exactly. You know, I don't because I feel like I haven't gotten any of the things that I have won over the last few years. I don't, I don't owe y'all shit. I took you out for barbecue the other night. What are you talking about? You didn't pay for it. No, he was I didn't. There. Yours, was, yours was way too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Did we tell Gabe this story? Yeah, yeah, yeah this yeah, is yeah, a yeah. Fun. Oh, yeah. okay. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, wasn't I think sure. we were texting about it. But yes, uh, I mean, I'm Yeah, that just... would have been a good chance for you to buy me a Whataburger. Ooh, God, why would I do that to you? That's, un- <laughs> that's unnecessary. All right, so the Oscars have uh, concluded. Christopher Nolan has his Oscar. Oppenheimer has won. And now we move on to next year's ceremony, of which we assume the Dune Part 2 will be a significant one um as you're uh, heading out the door and and wrapping up this week's episode tell us your favorite Hans Zimmer score um we were joking before the show that I I might have gone with Pirates of the Caribbean uh had I remembered the fact that Hans Zimmer didn't actually write the main theme yeah. of Pirates which most people would whistle uh in a crowd to get you to recognize it so go over his filmography let us know what you think uh Hans Zimmer's your favorite let's go with favorite score from him and um and we'll weigh in on that in the comments underneath the episode. Thank you guys for tuning in to our recap of the Academy Awards, as well as our second in, uh, conversation with Hans Zimmer on the show. Go back and find the previous one for Dune Part 1, where we also had Denis come on the show for his very first time. Um, and follow us on social media throughout the week as we chime in on all things movie related. We are at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, providing he's able to pull himself out of the uh, shock that he's in from Christopher Nolan holding a photograph of Christopher Nolan holding two Oscars. <laughs> Kevin sent us that photo today. I will let you in on this. And also a, a wonderful picture of Steven Spielberg photographing it in an outburger with his cell phone. The best part too is he keeps changing the <laughs> image of the real blend text thread to that. Yeah. And then Sean changes it back to Gabe as Einstein yeah. followed by Kevin changing it back <laughs> to Nolan. I keep yeah. getting yeah. notifications on my phone, but just realize that you guys changing <laughs> yeah. the picture yeah. back and forth. Big rift right. in the I, text thread. I am at Sean underscore O'Connell. Gabe is at Gabe Kovach and the show is at Robland. We're going to, we're going to have to say something now we're, we're really here's here's a note to publicists everywhere. If you want to win an Oscar, <laughs> put, put your people on the real blend. Sean, question for you, though. Yes. Yes. If we had the opportunity. OK. To talk Dune with some 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 more conversations with people who made Dune. Do you think we should do it? I would I would love to do that, Gabe. And a great opportunity for us to do that potentially would be when the sh- uh, the movie eventually makes its way to like a 4K uh or okay. blu-ray release right okay they're, i'll they're keep that in the, the sand available let's keep that in mind the pretty, it's just, it's pretty good. Like a glass bowl of sand. <laughs> <laughs> all right talk to you guys next week dunkirk sure oppenheimer baby one last yeah. time all right oppenheimer <laughs>